go into the world. And tell every man that you meet, there is a man on the cross. A Catholic take. What you need to know right now. A bold synthesis of inspiration and information. Keeping you up to date on the news and issues from a courageous Catholic perspective. A Catholic Take with Joe McLean starts now. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. Good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Donald Trump, we continue to talk about the results of the election last week, but uh, he's already making some big picks. In fact, this morning, I think it's going to be breaking news. The Cash Patel will be named director of CIA under the next Trump administration. Already, there have been some big ones. I mean, Christy Naom is going to be Homeland Security director. Let that sink in. We're going to have a conversation about Donald Trump and his picks for his cabinet at 14 past the hour with Sam McCarthy from the Washington stand. Stick around for that. And then Xavier Reyes, a hall is back on the team. He's going to be talking about his take on the election last Tuesday with Donald Trump, especially given how much conversation we've been having over the recent months of sort of in times prophecies. How does this fit in? Some people are thinking that Donald Trump was a gift sent to us by God to bring us back from the brink of third world war. Let's talk about that with Zavi Reyes Ahal, who is the author of the book Revelations, The Hidden Secret Messages and Prophecies of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And that's coming up at 30 past the hour. We will, put, of course, put all of the show notes for you together at the top of the hour at thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. And uh, Jake is back on the team today after a nice three-day rested weekend. Good morning to you, Jake. Thanks for being back on the team today. It's great to be here. We have a great show, and we're hoping that you'll help us spread the word by telling everyone you know today. Praise be to God. Let's pray. Let's get started. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful, O Mother of the Word Incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and now your saint of the day. Pope St. Martin I, pray for us. Martin was born in Tuscany at the end of the 6th century. He served as a papal nuncio under Pope Theodore I. Upon the death of Theodore in the year of our Lord 649, Martin was elected pope. The emperor, Constans II, was a supporter of the Monothelite heresy, and so Martin had himself consecrated without waiting for the customary imperial approval of his election. That same year, Martin also convened a council at the Lateran, which firmly condemned the heresy and issued excommunications. Emperor Constans sent the exarch Olympius into Italy while the council was still in session, with orders to influence the council or even kill Martin. Olympius failed at both goals, with one assassin claiming he was miraculously prevented from even seeing the Pope. Constance sent a second exarch, Calliopus, to depose Martin as a usurper. Martin, already ill, eventually gave himself up peacefully to avoid bloodshed, and he was taken to Constantinople as a prisoner, mistreated the whole way. After a long and cruel imprisonment, the patient pontiff was banished to the Crimea, where he finally succumbed to illness, abuse, and starvation in the year of our Lord 655, as the last pope to be martyred. For more about this day and others in the church's calendar, visit thestationofthecross.com slash saintsandseasons. Pope St. Martin I, pray for us. And now your headline news. The Blaze is reporting Daniel Penny on trial. Witnesses say they were frightened of Jordan Neely. Witnesses for the prosecution sounded more like they were brought to the court by Penny's defense team as they testified on the stand that they feared Neely's rant and threats of violence while they were trapped on the subway together. Lori Citro testified that she used a stroller to barricade her five-year-old from a belligerent and unhinged Neely. But perhaps the most shocking revelation to come from the trial so far is that the New York City Police Department 
have body camera footage that confirms that Neely, while unconscious, was still alive. By the time officers responded and Penny had released him from the chokehold. Such evidence cast doubt on the legitimacy of the charges against Penny. LifeSite News reports judge allows more evidence discovery in Biden big tech collusion lawsuit. The Western District of Louisiana's U.S. District Court has ruled in favor of the state of Missouri, allowing additional discovery in the significant Missouri v. Biden lawsuit, which scrutinizes government collaboration in social media censorship. This decision comes after the Supreme Court in June overturned a prior injunction which had prohibited entities including the White House, CDC, FBI, CISA, and the Surgeon General's Office from pressing social media platforms to suppress speech protected under the Constitution. The new Civil Liberties Alliance expressed optimism about the new ruling. And the BBC is reporting that the so-called bishop is calling on Welby to resign over church scandal. Justin Welby is facing mounting pressure to resign after it emerged last week that he did not follow up rigorously enough on reports of John Smythe's abhorrent abuse of more than 100 boys and young men. The so-called Bishop of Newcastle, Helen Ann Hartley, is the most senior member of the church to call on Mr. Welby to stand down. After others accused him of allowing abuse to continue between 2013 and Smythe's death in 2018, Three members of the church's parliament, the General Synod, accused the so-called Archbishop of allowing abuse to continue during this five-year period. They have started a petition calling for the Archbishop to resign, which has now been signed by more than 7,000 people. Those those are your headline news. The gospel today comes to us from uh, Luke chapter 17, verses 7 through 10. Jesus said to his apostles, But which of you, having a servant, plowing or feeding cattle, will say to him when he has come from the field, Immediately go, sit down to meet, and will not rather say to him, Make ready my supper, and gird thyself, and serve me whilst I eat and drink, and afterwards thou shalt eat and drink? Doth he think that the servant... For doing the things which he commanded him? I think not. So you also, when you shall have done all these things that are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which we ought to do. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Thanking people for doing what they were supposed to do anyway. Thanking people for doing what they were supposed to do anyway. I want you to let that sink in because that's at the heart of this. Cornelius Alapide, the great scripture scholar, would say, Christ represses the vainglory of his apostles, lest when by their exalted faith they had performed wonderful and stupendous acts, they might glory in them and not ascribe to God whose it is, the honor. I think if we're honest, most of us would have an issue with this. I mean, there's there's being polite, right? Do we thank our servers when we go to restaurants? We pay them. We even give them tips, but we still thank them, do we not? We thank people all the time out of a sense of charity or generosity or just being nice. But our Lord is making clear that we have to, like in his case with the apostles, he doesn't want them to, he doesn't want it to go to their heads. They need to do what they've been commanded to do. He goes on, for this servant, as clearly appears, truly deserved the daily payment due to him by agreement, but did not deserve that his master should render him thanks. For masters are not accustomed to bestow thanks upon those whom they pay for their labor. Thanks are only given to assistance rendered gratuitously and without payment. We who are the servants of God through the works ordered by him, if we offer them, merit eternal life, as the hired servant who has labored throughout the day deserves his daily payment. Acknowledge, Cornelius goes on to say, acknowledge we ourselves, therefore, to be servants, lending very many acts of obedience or on interest. Nor shall we exalt ourselves because we are called the sons of God. Grace is to be acknowledged. 
but nature is not to be passed over. Nor should we boast ourselves if we have served well in that which we ought to do. The sun obeys, the moon submits, the angels serve. Isn't it interesting compared to nature? We must do what we are obligated to do. We must do it even if we receive no thanks in the process. Let that sink in for a second. Haydock would say, the design and end of this parable is to show that rigorously speaking, we are useless servants with regard to God. This sovereign master has a right to exact of us every kind of service and to make us apply ourselves to any task he may think proper without our having any reason to complain either of the difficulty, trouble, or length of our labors. We are entirely his and he is master of our persons, time, and talents. But though we are unprofitable to him, our serving him is not unprofitable to us. For he is pleased to give, by his grace, a value to our good works, which is, in consequence of his promise, entitles them to eternal reward. If, and there's a big if, If we are found faithful until the very end, if, as our Lord says to us in the gospel, we persevere until the end, then guess what? We get to enjoy the beatific vision for all eternity. So what is the exchange there? A lifetime, 80 years of thank you, you did so well, pat me on the back, I feel so good now, can I have my cookie? Versus eternity in the beatific vision completely and totally satiated in the very presence of God. There is a thanks. It's coming. We've got to get there. We'll be right back. Did you know you can help evangelize simply by using your cell phone? The Station of the Cross is partnering with iCatholic Mobile, America's only Catholic mobile phone company. When you join iCatholic Mobile, a portion of every dollar will support our programming. Plus, you'll enjoy great service with iCatholic Unlimited 5G data, text, and talk. With iCatholic Mobile, you can stay connected with family and friends while also spreading the truth of Jesus Christ with clarity and charity. Join today at iCatholicMobile.com. be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McClain. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Hey, coming up at uh, 30 past the hour, we're going to have a conversation about Donald Trump winning, but from a different perspective. We're going to have uh, guest Xavier Reyes Ahal back on the team. He wrote the book, Revelations, The Hidden Secret, Messages and Prophecies of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And it'd be very interesting to get his take, especially as he's been talking quite a bit over on his YouTube channel, O Crux Ave Media, which we'll link to in the show notes today, about Donald Trump from the perspective of prophecy. Is he a gift from God? Is he an answer to prayer? Does this pull us back from the Third World War? Let's have those conversations with Xavier at 30 past the hour. Do join us if you can. But joining us right now from the Washington stand is Sam McCarthy. We had the great pleasure of having Sam on our live broadcast last Tuesday night. We went eight hours in a live coverage of the election returns. It was a lot of fun. Praise be to God. And we're glad to have Sam on the team today. Sam, good morning to you. Thank you for your time. Joe, thanks very much for having me. It's great to be talking with you again. I want to jump into the picks. And it's breaking this morning that CIA director could be Cash Patel in the next Trump administration. I want to get your take on some of these names that are already out there that he's named. And there's a few more still to come. But what is your general impression of Donald Trump picking his cabinet for his next four years? I think so far, it seems like his his chief directive in doing this is seeking people who are it's kind of twofold. One, loyal to him, people who have supported him, supported his agenda, supported the Make America Great Again movement, not necessarily always at every point. For example, you'll probably remember J.D. Vance back in 2016 criticized him and said that he could potentially be a dictator, uh, but has since come around to his side. He's picked a lot of people who are loyal to him, people who've demonstrated or proven loyalty over the course of the past several years, and people who seem to be passionate about what they're doing. Most of them tend to have a lot of experience in the field that they've been chosen for, uh, but they're definitely passionate about what they're doing. 
uh, like RFK Jr. is a great example with health, you know, with looking at, you know, gutting NIH, CDC, uh, FDA, getting rid of all the corruption and trying to, as he put it, make America healthy again. They're people who are really passionate about what they feel. I think that that's, that's a really, really good thing to have. People who aren't just doing this because they're assigned to it. People aren't just doing it because, you know, it's a nice salary or it's going to look good on a resume when they try to go to an oil company or an energy company, you know, after the administration. People are doing this stuff because maybe it's not popular, but they really feel strongly about it. I think that's fantastic. You know, Robert Kennedy's, uh, I guess he said this just yesterday, he w- plans to fire 600 employees at the National yeah. Institutes of Health. So it's going to be, I mean, that's, we got to keep in mind that those are people's jobs. And so they're going to have to be, they're going to need another job. So as much as we want to mm-hmm. gut and drain the swamp, these people are going to need work. They got mortgages to pay. So let's keep them in our prayers. But I want to throw some names out and get your take on them. Secretary of State, Marco Rubio, what do you think? So Rubio has not been uh, officially confirmed that I've seen as Secretary of State. I know New York Post just wrote a story. Uh, They report that Trump is poised to announce Rubio as Secretary of State. Uh, Personally, I I do like Rubio. I think that he's been a a pretty good senator. He's a good Catholic for the most part. He has one thing that I've noticed is he has waffled just a few months ago on abortion. He's been a pretty staunch Mm. pro-life advocate. Uh, for a very long time, but just kind of waffled a little bit on abortion, presumably in the hopes of getting the VP slot that eventually went to J.D. Vance, another Catholic who unfortunately also waffled on abortion. Mike Waltz, National Security Advisor. Uh, So far, that seems to be a really good pick. I actually just this morning, I was listening to an interview with uh, Mike Waltz where he was talking about some of the national security threats that we're facing and the best way to deal with them. One thing that I do appreciate that Trump has done is uh, he he issued that statement saying Mike Pompeo and Nikki Haley will not be part of his administration. They will not right. be invited. Yeah. Nothing. Wall Street Journal, I know they kind of hypothesized that that was uh, an effort to help J.D. Vance with the potential 2028 presidential run instead of giving Pompeo or Haley, you know, an administrative position that they could then rely on in running against Vance. But really, I think the main thing of it is no neocons. You know, we don't want neocons, Mm. the administration, people who are trying to fund the forever wars, people who see national security as a means of making money for themselves, for the military industrial complex, and then winding up in a nice cushy lobbying position following the administration. So I think that Waltz has really got kind of the right approach to it, which is protect our security and, you know, kind of end or defund the forever wars. So I'm, I, I at least am happy with that pick. I have to admit, I'm, I, I feel guilty for saying so, but I kind of liked Pompeo's book. I, I enjoyed going through it. I thought it was good stuff, but I'm also glad he's not in the, not on the lineup of the next cabinet to be sure. A deputy yeah. chief of staff for policy, Stephen Miller. I mean, uh, Charlie Kirk yesterday gushed. He gushed as hard for Stephen Miller yesterday as Donald Trump gushed over Elon Musk election night. It just feels a little odd. But how, what do you think of Stephen Miller as deputy chief of staff for policy? I think Stephen Miller is a really good pick. Uh, there's you, you remember back in uh, Trump's first administration, uh, he implemented that policy to keep to, to shut down the border when he wasn't getting uh, congressional support to shut down the border. He implemented that yeah. policy. It was, I think, uh, Title 42 disease policy, basically saying that, you know, we're going to have to keep you guys on the other side of the border, detain you over there instead of detaining you in the U.S. or releasing you into the U.S. You know, that was uh, uh, one of uh, then Vice President Mike Pence, one of his aides referred to that as a Stephen Miller special. So I think that Miller is especially with, you know, Trump's focus on border security, which is a huge issue. That's one of the things that drove Americans to the polls to vote for Trump. Uh, in record turnout numbers. He won the popular vote, you know. Uh, Immigration is such a big issue. And I think putting Miller as his deputy chief of staff for policy demonstrates that he does have, you know, immigration at the top of his mind. And Mm. I think that's a great pick. Miller's very innovative and creative. I think he's really going to get the job done. Speaking of immigration, the border czar, Tom 
Holman, he's he's creating some waves. That guy is very outspoken. Have you seen some of the clips of him on Capitol Hill just sort of laying waste, you know, the uh, scorched earth policy and responding to some of these uh, Congress women on the Hill? It's kind of it's kind of hilarious, to be honest with you. I think one of my favorite moments is he's talking to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and she says, um, she says, you know, asylum seeking is not a crime. He says, well, entering the border illegally is, and he cites, (laughs) you know, U.S. Code Section 825, whatever, you know, perfectly. He doesn't look at notes, nothing. The, The guy is as someone to run the border thing, and he's talking now about, I'm reading reports that he's talking about workplace immigration raids. Uh, He's talking about, you know, you probably saw the 60 Minutes interview where they ask him, you know, how much is this going to cost? We read an estimate that it could cost $88 billion. And he he said, well, what price do you put on national security? Is that too much to pay? Uh, They they ask him, you know, is there a way, you know, to do mass deportations without separating families? And he says, yeah, of course. Deport families together. Yeah, I saw Just that. The, the ideal guy to lead this. No, so I'm, I'm no apologies from, from Tom. No <laughs> apologies from Tom. All right, Homeland Security. I, honestly, I was surprised by this. South Dakota Governor Christy Naum is being named uh, in the Homeland Security Secretary position. What do you think of that? So that's another one that I haven't heard 100% confirmed. And actually, Charlie Kirk, who's been really close with the Trump uh, team, the Trump transition team, Kirk did just issue a warning. He said, guys, don't believe every report that you read. Wait until you hear Trump himself confirm who he's putting in which positions. Um, so I, By I the don't way, think that it would Forbes reported mean- it this morning that that, was the, that, mm-hmm. that that was the pick. But we'll see, I guess. Yeah, I haven't read the Forbes report yet. Uh, but I, I do know that I haven't heard Trump himself actually confirm that yet. You know, you've got a lot of outlets, and that's one of the things that I'm a little concerned about is I don't want to see a repeat of the first Trump term with, you know, an infiltration of the administration by, you know, yeah. neocons, bad actors, et cetera. And I think that you're going to see a lot of, especially these kind of uh, centrist outlets, uh, maybe kind of trying to push that by, you know, leaking, you know, interesting. Uh, this person is being considered, you know, uh, and trying to kind of manipulate public opinion. I'm, I do have, I am a little wary about that. So I am trying to wait for, uh, and also just as a reporter, I want to actually make sure that what I'm reporting is accurate. So, you know, I, I want to wait for it. To be this confirmed. morning, it's being reported on X CIA director is going to go to Cash Patel. Yeah. That's that would be the ideal pick. But again, you know, Trump hasn't actually announced that he's probably mulling it, probably maybe even testing the waters, you know, seeing like, hey, what do you guys think? I think Cash Patel is great. I don't know if you've read Lee Smith's books. He has won the uh, the plot against the president and the permanent coup. Both of them. Excellent. They're about how the deep state tried to bring down the first Trump administration. Excellent books, really thorough reporting. Cash Patel played a crucial role in exposing the deep state. And so if he's put in charge of the CIA, he's someone who's going to be aware of that. And he's someone who knows how to deal with it, someone who knows how to really cripple that. So I I think that that would be an excellent pick. But again, I just I haven't heard it 100 percent confirmed yet. Uh, EPA, Lee Zeldin. Yeah, that's another one of those ones where I think it's somebody who's really passionate about what he's doing or what he's working on doing. Uh, Cause he's not, you know, he doesn't have a whole lot of experience, technical or specialist experience in environmentalism in environmental protection, but he really knows what he's talking about. And he's really passionate about, you know, uh, protecting and increasing U S energy independence uh, and doing it in a way that is clean, that is safe. That's not going to, you know, uh, commit all these atrocities that, you know, the stop oil people are whining about and, you know, having fever nightmare dreams about, you know? So I, I think that that's another, another great example of somebody who's doing something because he's passionate about doing it. Interesting. We're going to run out of time here in a moment with Sam McCarthy from the Washington stand, but Sam, I want to get your quick comments on this that I thought was very interesting this morning. A lot of uh, pro Israeli accounts this morning were, we're loving Marco Rubio, Elise Stefanik, U.S. ambassador pick there. Uh, d- is this signaling that Donald Trump is going to work hand in glove with the Netanyahu government? 
I don't think necessarily. I think that he's a, a strong enough and a principled enough individual that his whole agenda has been put America first. I think he's certainly friendly with them. And I think that he's going to be polite and cordial. Remember, he brokered, he brokered the Abraham Accords during his first administration. I think that he's committed to bringing about peace, but not funding endless war. Mm. You're going to have a, an article out later today from the Washington stand sort of breaking down your thoughts on these cabinet picks. Is that true? Yeah. So I'm basically just going to do a brief profile on who's confirmed, who's kind of rumored to be in. We'll see how things shape up as we get closer to inauguration day. We still have some big picks to come. Attorney general, defense secretary. Everybody's got their eyes on, on defense secretary, energy secretary, education treasury tulsi gabbard was begging on uh on a show last night for 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 an opportunity put me in coach i want to play i thought that was kind of fun so we'll have to see check out washingtonstand.com we'll put a link to where you can find sam's articles directly there in our show notes today but washingtonstand.com is the link you can check out later today for his opinion sam mccarthy great having you on last week great have you back today god bless you my friend thanks joe god bless All right, coming up right after the break, more breaking news and stories. Let's talk about Donald Trump from a prophecy perspective. We're going to have Xavier Reyes Ahal, author of Revelations, the Hidden Secret Messages and Prophecies of Blessed Virgin Mary, to get his take on last Tuesday. Are we stepping back from the brink? That's coming up next. Don't go anywhere. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McClain, and here are your headline news. The Daily Wire is reporting Fauci got $15 million in taxpayer-funded security services after he retired. That's a good deal. The government watchdog organization opened the books, found the evidence in a memorandum of understanding between the U.S. Marshals Service and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services via a Freedom of Information Act request. Open the books is Deputy Policy Editor Amber Todorov and the dossier investigative journalist Jordan Schachtel reported that the money covered, quote, salaries and benefits for deputies and administrative personnel assigned to Fauci's protective detail costs related to transporting Fauci and law enforcement equipment, close quote. It went on to say we could find no other cases of a former federal employee receiving this level of protection, OTB noted succinctly. That's a good good package there for Fauci, don't you think? A Just the News reports Democrat rep doubles down on remarks supporting trans athletes not competing in women's sports. Rep Seth Moulton, a Democrat from Massachusetts, said, quote, I was just speaking authentically as a dad about one of many issues where I think we're just out of touch with the majority of voters, and I stand by my position. He said during a weekend appearance on MSNBC, going on to say Democrats spend way too much time trying not to offend anyone rather than being brutally honest about the challenges many Americans face, he told the New York Times. Quote, I have two little girls. I don't want them getting run over on a playing field by a male. But as a Democrat, I'm supposed to be afraid to say that, close quote. One of Moulton's aides has ended up quitting over these remarks, but he said, quote, The backlash I've received proves my point that we can't even have the discussions as a party, close quote. You're just now figuring that out? Hmm, interesting. A Catholic vote reports Republicans keep the House. The Republican Party has maintained control of the U.S. House of Representatives in the 2024 elections, Decision Desk HQ projects, combined with the resounding victory of President-elect Donald Trump and a comfortable majority of 53 seats in the Senate, the party will now hold the presidency in both houses of Congress, commonly referred to as a trifecta. And those, those are your headline news. Praise be to God in all things. So big, big turnout. Obviously, we've been covering and talking a lot about Donald Trump's landslide victory Tuesday night. But we've been also talking a lot about the end times and prophecies and prophetic visions as of late because it seemed like we're on the brink of Third World War and a catastrophe, a a tribulation of sorts. And we've had these conversations in the past with our good friend Xavier Reyes Ahal. He is the uh, author of Revelations, The Hidden Secret Messages and Prophecies of the Blessed Virgin Mary, which we're going to link to today for you in the show notes at thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. Xavier! 
Good morning to you, my friend. How are you? Good morning, Joseph. Very well. Very happy to be back. I'm glad you're here. Praise be to God. So what were your initial thoughts Tuesday when you uh, when you heard the news? What what were you thinking? Well, um, to tell you the truth, I um, I was not sleeping. I, I uh, stayed up all, the whole night because although a Frenchman, um, my, uh, my wife is American. My children are half American, half French, and I love this country. So obviously, um, I, when um, Donald Trump um, won through a triumph, because it was not just a, a close victory, it was utter and utter triumph against the Democrats, I rejoice for the Americans, most of all. Uh, because most of all, this means um, a choice which uh, translates into finally an avenue of diplomacy and of peace, particularly with uh, the world conflicts around the world today. Uh, since one has to remember that and so far there has never been any diplomatic um, avenue uh, proposed or brought forth by the present uh, presidential administration uh, or by any other party, uh, besides that of perhaps uh, Viktor uh, Erdogan, uh, Slovan, uh, from Hungary, and uh, mm. uh, the fact, but it was immediately rejected. So it seems that Donald Trump, uh, first of all, for the well-being of this country, the internal well-being of this country, economic um, and also diplomatic, uh, this is an answer that the American people clearly has voiced without the shadow of any doubt they are in favor of. And the victory of yesterday uh, with the Republicans winning the House of Representatives clearly demonstrates that fact. It's a confirmation. I find it interesting that uh, Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump have already had conversations by phone. Donald Trump is already starting to work that diplomatic solution to get to find a, you know, a way to come to peace in the Ukraine. I also find it interesting that we have now for many months been working with our allies in the UK to reestablish air bases throughout the Pacific Rim because we are preparing for a war, a physical war with China by 20, I think it was 2028, I think if I'm not mistaken, 2027, 2028, they're expecting an invasion of Taiwan with military forces. And we're, we're bringing back the ban from World War II. A lot of people think we're on the brink of World War III. Do you think we've bought ourselves some time with the election of Donald Trump? To be very honest with you, I think we are right on course. Um, You're absolutely right. I just watched uh, the French news uh, for about an hour to be prepared for your show to to echo what um, the European medias uh, are bringing to the European populations. This particular peace plan that you just mentioned uh, from Donald Trump in the communication he had with Vladimir Putin and with his people uh, clearly uh, underlines a um, scenario which allows Russia to maintain and keep Crimea and all the territories conquered in Donbass to Russia and uh, a contractual or um, treaty which would speak uh, confirm that Ukraine will not be permitted to enter into NATO for the next 20 years. According to French media this morning, um, Russia received this very positively, but of course have declared that it is not yet uh, acceptable terms. 20 years uh, is not nearly enough. Um, Mm. According to them, according to French sources, the Russian would be more in favor of indeed keeping the territories earned and um, not allowing NATO to go into, or rather, Ukraine to go into NATO for the next 80 to 100 years. Now, as for China and Asia, quite so, uh, the um, the Americans are preparing. And not just the Americans, the Americans are trying to include the English, the French, NATO itself, incredibly enough, which has nothing to do there. As far as prophecy is concerned, uh, you'll remember that, uh, I don't know if your auditors know this, but you were ever so kind to organize in June, a international conference on YouTube with uh, some of the best uh, Marian podcasts on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, listening to Father Michel Rodrigue bring forth some of the prophecies and a particular message of the Blessed Virgin Mary. In that revelation, the Virgin Mary announced that there will be a conference piece that will take in Europe. In the course of this conference piece, there will be an assassination which will be successful 
of a most important political party. And this assassination, this successful assassination, according to prophecy, will lead one major nation to officially declare war on another. And the version to add, with profound tears in her eyes um, and an imploring voice in, in coming from her lips, stating that France would be one of the principal instigators of this war to come, I regret to say. Wow. So France at the center of this, which kind of reminds us of the prophecy of the French monarch, Henry V, that will come and bring peace. But but that only comes after, what was it, a third of the world's population dies. So can we officially say that in that prophecy, that is the Third World War? Um, indeed. And this comes principally from the prophecies of Marie-Julie Jahini, which you were ever so kind uh, to honor me in inviting me and talking about it. Marie-Julie Jahini declared indeed that there will be three crises. First, there will be um, an upheaval within the Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church, a revolution of sorts where a false ideology will come forth uh, from a general uh, gathering from the hierarchy members of the Catholic Church. An infiltration of sorts will enter within the Roman Catholic Church and will bring forth new ideas, new ideologies, which will be foreign to dogma. They will be successful. In that particular time, there will be complete and total confusion, where at the same time, geopolitically speaking, in some of the principal nations of the European continent, such as marie Lichonie was specific, uh, Germany, Italy, Spain, England, and most of all France, there will be upheaval within these countries, sorts of revolution, civil unrest, from uh, the words used were new French, and uh, from Frenchmen and Europeans of papers. In other words, foreigners who've come to the European um, territories, continent, who've got their national identity papers, their passports, they will revolt to make the laws of the republics and the hosting nations bent to the law of the Sharia, uh, so that Islam may rule not just politically, but religiously in these nations. It will cause chaos. And the second crisis will come sometimes thereafter, according to Marie, Julie Jahini, which will bring a third world conflict, particularly on the European continent, which will see um, an alliance between Russia and a consortium of Muslim nations who will take advantage of the disorder and the disarmament, the lack of uh, weapons, ammunition in European arsenals uh, to take to start a blitzkrieg of sorts, which mm -hmm. will see Russian armies um, advance on Western European soil all the way to the Rhine River and Northern Italy, while a Muslim force will disembark in Sicilia, Sardinia, Corsica, South Italy, South of France, Costa del Sol, and Andalusia in Spain. The, the French king will come sometimes thereafter. It will be a very quick war. And the Re French king, uh, whose name is Henri V de la Croix, Henry V of the Cross, will be called by a French privileged soul who will cross, who will come to seek him, rather, uh, to come back to France. And it will be a time when France, when the Russians will throw the dice and will bet that France will not retaliate with its nuclear arsenal and will start an invasion of France, uh, which will be only partial. They will not complete the invasion. The entire war in France will, la will last less than a year. The king will return, push back the Russians and the Muslims back to the sea, and start a campaign of liberation in Italy. Uh, Rome will be conquered indeed by Rome, by Rome, by the Russians, I beg your pardon, while the southern part will be conquered by the Muslims. And this war in Italy will be quite bloody and will last about three years. You know, as you were talking about that, I, one of the thoughts that came to my mind was about just the practical, the practical reality of armies and military spending in Europe as compared to the United States. Most of the NATO countries are dependent upon the United States to provide material and man support because they simply don't have the armies anymore. They, in the decades after World War II, they have really scaled back. So are they even capable of fighting a ground war, which – I mean because part of that prophecy – I think you've been asked this before several times. What about the United States? Where do you see the United States? And I think if I'm not mistaken, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but if I'm not mistaken, you have said in the past that the United States doesn't have much of a role in that. But 
we're the ones supplying the tanks and the guns and the ammo and the artillery shells, which, by the way, we've given over to the Ukraine cause. for. for so our, our stocks are depleted in that, which puts us at a complete disadvantage, which puts Europe and France at a complete disadvantage in that conflict. Would you agree to that? I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, you're absolutely right, Joe. You have a very lucid uh, vision of the situation. Um, there was a French general who was inter being interviewed um, uh, two days ago on French TV. And um, he repeated what he said a couple of months ago uh, in the midst of the Ukrainian war. Uh, there, is, there are two kinds of possible wars on the European continent, conventional and nuclear, or mm. both. In matters of conventional warfare, you're absolutely right. Um, countries like France, according to him, uh, has enough ammunition back in its reserves, in its arsenal, to last in a conventional fight for about, listen to this, 11 <laughs> Wow. Hold that thought Germany right there. Now. That music That music means we're right at a break with Xavier Reyes Ahal. He is, he is, uh, he's got a YouTube channel we're going to link to, O Crux Ave Media. We're going to link to that, plus his book, Revelations. But two days of fighting, that's not going to last very long. When it comes down to it, which means nuclear war, which means many people suffer and die, which means we should be ready today to meet our maker. So we don't have to stress about these things. More on that with Xavier coming up after the break. Don't go anywhere. Be right back. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. Good to be on with you. Praise be to God. And I want to give a special shout out to our good friends, iCatholicMobile.com, sponsor of our program, iCatholicMobile.com. You know, it's unlimited data, praise be to God, and they don't throttle you at the end of the month. And just like us, they too believe that there is no salvation outside of the Catholic Church, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, the sacrament of salvation on planet Earth, what God has done for mankind, and we want to be on that team too. So we're very grateful to partner up with them. iCatholicMobile.com. Mention my name. I think they waived the activation fee. I'm just saying. Praise be to God. They also give steep discounts to Catholic religious communities as well, if you're interested. iCatholicMobile.com. Xavier Reyes Ahal is our guest. He is the author of Revelations, The Hidden Secret Messages and Prophecies of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And he's got a YouTube channel, O Crux Ave Media. We're going to put a link to that in the show notes for you as well. You can find them. On YouTube, Xavier, welcome back. We've been talking about the brink of World War III, in, uh, in, especially in light of the Donald Trump election. And I find it interesting because um, I think a lot of people have been saying that Donald Trump is a gift from God. He's, uh, he's bought us four more years. And I think there is some truth to that. Don't, don't get me wrong. I believe there is some truth. I think he's the most reasonable Republican over the last however many Republican uh, presidencies when it comes to foreign policy in particular – he doesn't have a problem calling up the supposed enemy and having a conversation, whereas all other presidencies are like, no, we can't have those talks. Like, it seems bizarre. Even Ronald Reagan, had, you know, called up Gorbachev and had conversations, you know, Khrushchev or whomever else. So I, I applaud Donald Trump for that. And I do think if there's anybody who has a chance to buy us some time, it is his administration. But you're saying that we could still be looking at a, at a, a thermal nuclear war because – of how much we have spent all of our uh, other options, really. Well, if we're talking about prophecy, yes. I, I regret to say it's not something that I enjoyed uh, confirming, but it is a fact. According to prophecies, um, indeed, um, there will be an con ongoing um, a war that will um, go from bad to worse from this particular conflict that is taking place today in Eastern Europe and from the Middle East. Um, also, in, uh, on one particular aspect and on, from different um, prophecies, uh, particularly of this Canadian priest uh, who is the um, creator of his own uh, Catholic new order, no? uh, Father Michel Rodrigue, he, the Virgin Mary and our Lord uh, told him to um, ask the faithful to pray for peace and to keep an eye not just on Russia, but on Iran and North Korea who, according to prophecy, will make a surprise attack uh, on the United States. As for Marie Lijani, before the break, you were mentioning something which is quite, uh, quite true. You mentioned that uh, in this particular prophecy from France, from this uh, extraordinary uh, mystic and stigmatist, she's considered in the Catholic Church 
the foremost stigmatist in the history of the Catholic Church. Marie-Julie Shahini announced that the Americans will not come to the assistance of their European allies. Now, as you know, I've been working, I've worked with Father René Laurentin for about eight years on a, petit, on a particular apparition case we've been working on together. Father René Laurentin, for uh, your, some of the viewers who might not know who he was, the Americans used to call him the Marian Jacques Cousteau because um, mm. he was the foremost expert in Marian apparition site around the world. He was actually responsible for the approval uh, process of the approved apparition site of uh, San Nicolas in Buenos Aires, Argentina, in Betania, wow. in, in Venezuela, and in Quibejo, in Rwanda, and in Sufani. So I worked with him for eight years of my life. And Father, when Father René Laurent and I, when we did discuss this prophecy of Marie-Julie Jahini, but the Americans not coming, he was very perplexed. And he explained, well, look, there must be only one or two explanations for this to happen. Number one, either the American will be hit tremendously and severely, either by nature and or by an attack of sorts. And or it could be that their attention and their interest might lie elsewhere in another theater of operation. Then he looked into emptiness for a moment, then he looked at me again and said, uh, the Pacific? That was in 1996, 1997. That was a very wow. lucid prophecy at the time. No, China. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we're focused there pretty hard right now, I would say, rebuilding old airfields from World War II because we think we're about to get into a, an actual physical com conflict with China over that. Xi Jinping asking his military forces to be prepared for that armed conflict. I think it was by 2028. All right, so what, what do you recommend the average Catholic to do in light of, of this prophecy or what we're seeing in the headline news right now? You know, with unchecked immigration across Europe, most of which is Muslims, which would lead to an army of Islam being able to inflict some severe damage on the European continent. What what should the Catholics do? That's a very, that's a very good question. In these particular times, um, as apparitions still go on and on, uh, you'll remember that in, for instance, places like Medjugorje, which just received the Nihil of Stadt, uh, from Rome recently. Uh, the Virgin Mary, who one of its visionaries, appearing as well in June of this year to uh, said visionary, I think it was Maria uh, or Ivanka, I'm not certain which one. The Virgin asked for a um, novena of rosaries for peace. Now, to other visionaries around the world, she's done the same thing. Uh, in the course of, uh, again, um, Father Michel Rodrigue, whom I'm still I'm opening a dossier now for the Diocese of uh, Amos, because his case are extraordinary. People who get uh, uh, converted, people who, thanks to this particular case, get miraculous healings. It's extraordinary. And in any case, in this particular apparition, the Virgin also, at the same time, and to other visionaries around the world, by the way, the Virgin continued to ask and confirm the request of the Novena of Rosaries. She asked as well that we pray the Holy Rosary every day, that we go to confession, if we can, once a month, at least, preferably on first Saturdays. And most of all, the Virgin Mary in heaven, through the Virgin Mary, invites the faithful to go to Mass, to go back to Mass at least every Sunday. It's imperative. And to receive the body of Christ, the body and blood, soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, through the holy sacrament of the altar, in full conscience that we're not receiving just, oh, we're not receiving at all a symbol of the Last Supper, not at all but we're receiving the true person of our Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Sacrament of the altar. And she asks the Virgin Mary that we receive him always in a state of grace. In other words, Amen. if any of the um, faithful go to Mass and suspect they have committed a great wrong, possibly even a mortal sin, not to receive the body of, of our Lord. And she referred to the writings of St. Paul in the New Testament not to eat and drink our own perdition, our own condemnation. We must, if we are subject to mortal sin, before receiving Holy Communion, heaven says, we must go and seek a Catholic priest, ask him to hear our confession, and have him give us God's absolution. Once, and only once, after we receive his absolution, to go to Mass. The Virgin Mary, as well, echoes the request of heaven, asking in order for 
not for peace, because she says that now the war will not be able to be stopped. Only the intensity can be diminished. But she asks as well that we consecrate ourselves, our homes, our beloved ones, to the Sacred Heart of Christ and to the Immaculate Heart of the Virgin Mary, and to abandon ourselves to the, at the feet of the cross, to pray for the Pope, to pray for the hierarchy, to pray for the Catholic Church, that God illuminates them and make them seize in some instances the errors of their ways, but to remain faithful to the Catholic Church and to the Magisterium and to pray for the Pope. That is and well the... Said. Well said, Xavier. We're out of time on the radio side. If you have a moment to hang out in the after show, uh, Penn State Dad, one of our ACT insiders, is really anxious for me to ask you a follow-up question on sacramentals. So maybe we'll do that in the after show. If you want to continue on with us, you got to go to the stationofthecross.com forward slash ACT where you can catch the live video player there and be a part of the conversation either on YouTube, Facebook, we're on Rumble, we're on X. Wherever you'd like us to be, we're there. Praise be to God. The station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. Check out Xavier's YouTube channel, Ocroxave Media. We'll put a link to that, as well as his book, Revelations, in our show notes today at the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. Coming up tomorrow, Eric Sammons is back on the team and Edward Clancy. Praise be to God. Bishop Strickland's got a big day coming. That's also ahead. We'll see you there. God love you and God bless you. The Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network is dedicated to answering the critical need of access to quality, consistent, professional, and proven Catholic programming. We cannot rely on other media outlets to properly represent our church. Catholic Radio reaches Catholics, non-Catholic Christians, and non-believers alike. As a nonprofit lay organization financially independent of your diocese, our apostolate is listener-supported. And we're back. Welcome to the after show, everyone. Hey, good morning, everybody. Praise be to Jesus. Thanks for hanging out with us again today. Really appreciate having you guys on the team. If you've never commented before, let us know where you're from. We'd love to know where you're from. Praise be to Jesus. We got some folks hanging out on X. If you're on X right now, let us know. Uh, Mimi, good morning to you. Good to see you here. Junior Barra, Patty, our friends over on the, uh, our usual suspects. Jane, I see you there. Don Paddock, good morning over on the Facebooks. I see Paul, our friend from Buffalo, James 16897 on our insider crew. Paul, Damon, good morning to you. Uh, Eileen, I see you there. Sharon, good morning. Hope you're feeling really well today. Troy Lockett, good morning. Praise be to God. Yvonne, I see you there. Janice, good morning to you. Mike Kay is back. Karen Collins, good morning. Praise be to God. Glad to see you guys today. Hopefully you're doing really well. Uh, Jen Nugent, good morning to you. Len Pine, Gus DMH, Robert DeBruce, and Penn State Dad over on the Rumbles. I'm going to get back to you here in a second, Penn State. Hey, Mutsan, good morning to you. Laura, KSW Benedict and O'Blay, Craig, good morning to you. Ginger Grandma, 71. Ginger Gamer. Welcome and good morning. What is it? Ginger Gamer. Is it what? I said Grandma. Yes. Poor Ginger Gamer. That's too bad. <laughs> Man, see, it does not pay to hang out see, with me. See, gamers are I'll the get most your name oppressed wrong. group. I'm, I'm still correct on that. I'll get your name wrong every time. It's not You, you deserve better. Hey, Yvonne, good morning to you. Uh, Gregory, good morning. Bridget Dunn is back. Good to see you here. Deborah Saints, good morning to you. Lost Creole. James, I see you there. Vigilante Warrior, I'm 42. I guess that's Vigilante. I'm old, and it's very far away, so I'm, I'm having to stretch. Uh, good morning to you. Welcome, and thanks for hanging out with us today. Colin, I see you there. Praise be to God. Let me know if you have questions for Mr. Xavier. Night of the Immaculata, Angel Night. Welcome back. Lights 10. Welcome. So let's go. I want to go to Penn State's question. He's been chomping at the bit, begging me to get Xavier back on the show for a long time now because he's just he needs some information. And it's about sacramentals, Xavier. He wants to know how, what is the process with storing blessed grapes? First of all, what are blessed grapes? And then how do we store them for preparing for three days of darkness in times? What do you say, Xavier? Okay. The story of the blessed grape comes principally from um, two different sources. Two di- you're still and breaking up pretty good. Yeah. Lose them you're, you're losing big chunks of your, uh, of your yeah, answer. Yeah, your here, internet. Xavier. 
Um, could you um, actually try um, maybe Zavier, reconnect? Could you, yeah, oh, could you try closing out of the link and then reconnecting? And then we'll. While get we're back. doing that, I'll read a couple of comments. Moodsan makes a good point. Says, "Seek ye first the kingdom." Luke twelve twenty two thirty five says these prophecies only serve to cause anxiety. Just focus on piety and holiness and pray for reparation. I think it's a great point, Moodsan. I also think that's what Xavier reiterated at the end there on the radio side, basically saying, "Make a good confession, receive worthily, live in a state of grace, pursue virtue." And then you don't really have to worry about much anything else. Although I think our Lord tells us very clearly in, in the gospel that we are to know the sign of the times and react accordingly. We can't know the day or the hour of anything, but we can know the signs of the times. We should be paying attention to those. But live in a state of grace. At the end of the day, I don't have to be a Thomistic theologian to live in a state of grace and pursue virtue. That's, that's beholden upon every human being, no matter their state in life. And I think it's great, great, great uh, advice. I got to... Why you why YouTube when I hit the pop out do you always limit the chat? I gotta change the chat. By the way, uh, let's see here. KSW Benedictine Noble, you're amazing. God bless you. Says thank you, Xavier. We will continue to pray the rosary. I'll let him know when he comes back. Uh, Petra, good morning to you. Says I don't have Hawthorne leaves yet. We're gonna get him to take his take on Hawthorne when he comes back. Xavier, are you back? We have your better connection this time. I am back. Can you hear me better? Yeah, you seem to not be breaking up this time. Praise be to God for that. Benedictine, uh, KSW, Benedictine Oblate says uh, that they love you and that they're so grateful for you and that uh, they will continue to pray the rosary as you as you so well stated. So let's talk more about these. Uh, so let's go back. Now that we have a better connection, bless grapes, hawthorne leaves, all of these things that keep coming up when people have conversations about say the three days of darkness or what have you. Tell me about the sacramentals. Yes. Most of these sacramentals that I write on my French stigmat, whom, by the way, her case is absolutely extraordinary, Joseph. Believe it or not, since she began receiving this in the 70s, all the way to her death in 1940, which is extraordinary that in this enormous collection, she ever proven remedy as they have been announced with the precision of a Swiss clock. And this is quite alarming, I submit to you, because indeed one could say, well, if she has never been wrong, for instance, about the Franco-Prussian War, the First World War, the Second World War, the Algerian War, uh, the coming in the invasion of the European continent with millions of immigrants, and so on and so forth, then what is to come for the future, uh, the chances of of those things happen are extremely high. And you would be right. So in regards to the sacramentals, which principally were brought forth by Marie Jeligeny, and in regards to the grapes, uh, those come from two different dossiers. The first one from one that, uh, from a visionary who got, uh, remarkably enough, the approval, the support, and the imprimatur of a local bishop, Luz mm. de Maria. She is a Central American lady who now, from my understanding is, she lives in Argentina. And the other one, and the other source of these uh, grapes, Sacramentos comes from a Reverend Father Michel Rodrigue, whom um, uh, the apparition are not approved. Uh, they are even, to a certain extent, there's been a letter by the local bishop stating that they do not recognize as authentic or coming from heaven uh, his prophecies, but they do not condemn it. They do not condemn Father Michel, and they still uh, allow him to talk and to profess uh, his um, uh, apostolate accordingly. I know because I called the Diocese of Amos, and they confirmed that Father Michel Rodrigue is in good standing and indeed allowed to, to talk. He has not been forced or ordered to silence. So these two sources talk about the blessed grapes. And these particular blessed grapes, according to both of those two visionaries, are supposed to be a source of nourishment uh, for those who would dedicate themselves to the devotion and are supposed to last for about three months' time, which according to both Luth de Maria and Reverend Father Michel Rodrigue, uh, they will be necessary for a period of time when uh, access to the market will not be authorized to those who will not wear upon themselves a particular device that will uh, have to go through a machine, allowing them and proving that these people have been vaccinated, uh, have been uh, submitted to an approval by the local government. So this particular sacrament of the blessed grapes, as you mentioned, um, is are supposed to be 
a certain amount of grapes, uh, one of which alone, according to prophecy, once they will be blessed, will allow to give nourish enough nourishment for one person and kill his or her hunger for one day per um, per um, per grape. How do you call it? Red. Grape, yes. And French is raisin, so grape. So uh, to tell you the truth, I spoke about it to Father uh, Michel Rodrigue in Quebec, with whom I'm still working, and I'm building a dossier for the diocese for an investigation to take place officially, as Father Laurentin taught me. And he told me, yes, uh, the grapes must be taken, uh, left with uh, a stem, and the, the first one can be blessed. And then with the one that has been blessed, blessed, you can make the sign of the cross on the others and bless them all, in cognac, or the Americans would use brandy or the Scots, uh, scotch or whiskey. I myself put them in Grand Marnier, <laughs> and uh, I had them blessed by a priest. I, I took an entire jar for my two munchkins, my wife and myself, put everything in uh, carefully in a, a great container filled with Grand Marnier from France. No, <laughs> put it to the priest. <laughs> of course. Of course. <laughs> I told the priest, look, this is an old Marian devotion. Would you be so kind, Father, to bless it for me? He did. So I have that, and uh, that is the answer to your question about the grapes. The sacramentals. Marie Julie Janier recommends others that are of the prime importance, particularly. Bef before you move on to the others, let me just ask a follow up question on the grapes. Because some people have been asking, well, last time I think we discussed this, right, Jake? Can you freeze the grapes? How do you store the grapes long term? Excellent question. No. Uh, you just put them in uh, cognac or brandy, some strong alcohol that is over 40%. It will be preserved accordingly. And these particular grapes, once blessed, following the requirement or the request of heaven, will miraculously remain fresh and will be used as a source of nourishment at the appointed time. That is a promise given by heaven through these two particular visionaries. And it'll taste, I mean, it'll, it'll be a good time when you do have to eat them because they're going to taste like brandy or whatever. All right, so some of the other sacramentals. Hawthorne leaves comes up a lot. What, what is that? What's the background? Yes, now the Hawthorne leaf uh, leads to a very serious question. Marie-Julie Jahini um, has brought forth in her prophecies that during this war, uh, that should last about three years and a half, perhaps a, a bit more, the arrival of the king and so on and so forth, will be part of a chapter of chastisement that will be for humanity after a warning that Marie Lichani as well mentioned in two small paragraphs, but she mentioned that there will be indeed um, a last warning and last manifestation of God's mercy on humanity to convert before it's too late. Um, there will be con many conversions, but the chastisement will come forth, translated principally through a world conflict and also through a major epidemic, um, an illness of sort, that will make uh, COVID-19 look like a picnic in mm. comparison. This particular disease will be called by the Americans the burning plague, the French wow. uh, la peste brûlante, and so on and so forth. There will be, according to the prophecy through Marie-Julie Jahini, um, the man's medical art will have no answer for it, but there will be only one particular uh, healing and um, cure for this sort of thing. It will be the hawthorn leaf. Now, the Virgin Mary, it's, it's all explained in, um, in Revelations in my book. The Virgin Mary has even given uh, the formula to prepare a fusion, an infusion rather, um, to alter the spread of this disease, to save those victims uh, if taken on time and uh, using the hawthorn leaf. My main idea is to spread the message from heaven to those, not to sell books. Therefore, I will tell you right now what the formula is, as quickly as I can. The Virgin Mary has asked, when the first symptoms of this burning plague comes, which will show uh, through a tremendous burning red patch on your body, you know, which will affect as well the high blood pressure, which will increase to the point of affecting your thinking mind and even your speech. It will develop a speech impediment. Immediately, the Virgin Mary asked to make this fusion of um, tea, a tea of sorts, with those leaves, uh, making water boil, first of all. Then, as soon as it boils, to turn off the fire. Put the leaves on the on the hot water, cover it with a cover of salt for 14 minutes. Not 13, not 15. And do not ask me why. Those are the instructions of the Virgin Mary given to stigmatist Marie-Julie Jahini. After 14 minutes, 
when it's supposed to pass this fusion into a filter sort, coffee filter, tea filter, and drink it three times a day with a certain uh, list of very short prayers, but to do it until finally one is totally cured. Now, the Vajme has clearly stated that if taken too late, uh, the next symptoms will be when this red patch becomes somewhat darker to the point of being black. And when there is a yellow center in the middle of it, it will be too late. The Virgin Mary nevertheless said and recommends her children, those who, for, for whom it will be too late, to continue taking the infusion, it will allow them to have a peaceful death and a and painful one. But for the time being, this will be, according to a revelation given to Marie-Julie Jahini, the only um, source of uh, uh, um, recovery and protection against this ghastly disease, this burning plague, that is about to be for the earth at the time of the war. Wow. That seems pretty serious. I'm pretty sure that I think my wife does have Hawthorne, actually. Uh, Crumble Blessinger. Bonjour from Long Island. From Long Island. Hello from Catherine, uh, Crumble Singer says. Glad you're here. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Penn State says, I've got my blessing, gra- blessed grapes and Hawthorne leaves put aside and I have water barrels ready to be filled since I'm disabled. I don't see myself heading to any refuge, so I'll be staying in my home. Honeywise25, welcome back, says, could you please ask Xavier in his opinion when it comes to the end of times? Does he think we are on the hour, minute, or second hand? I guess Honey West wants to know how close do you think we are? Where are we at on the, uh, on the timeline of end times events, Xavier? That's a brilliant question. First of all, I want to bring to your attention and to your auditors the fact that uh, the apocalypse is not announced. The world will go on. It will be, this is the end of an era and the beginning of a new one. And uh, this, all this chastisement bit will cease with the three days of darkness, which has been brought forth as well by Saint Padre Pio and so many other saints and visionaries around the world. But in matters of timeline, we only have, from all the apparition signs approved, and otherwise that I've studied and wrote about in my book, there is only one that gives you a major clue, that gives us a major clue. That's again Marie-Julie Jahini. And I'll explain um, on a couple of messages that she received from our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord told her that all these prophetic events, uh, which have been brought forth to her attention, or rather to ours through her, will begin to unravel during the year 80, all the way to the year 83, and that the year 84 will be devastating. For Pete's sake, Joseph, I just was scratching my head for months on and then trying to understand what did our Lord mean? Why the year 80? Why not 1980 or 2008? Or why mm-hmm. this particular year? I really couldn't figure it out for the life of me. So I decided to blooming, ignore it, and continue writing the chapter. It took me three years to write this this chapter alone. And finally, uh, when I reached the end, there was a prophecy made by our Lord to Marie Jolie saying, the day will come many years after your death, where you and your sister, your bodies, your remain, will be exhumed. And at that time, when they exhume your body, they will find yours and your sisters totally and perfectly incorrupt. But what's mm. more, at that time, when they'll find yours, they will find in your incorrupt body, your heart still beating. That is extraordinary. This only happened once before in history. And that was with Joan of Arc when they tried to burn her. And uh, Cardinal Winchester ordered twice the burning of her remains because they remain incorrupt. Her heart, even after the second burning, remained incorrupt and still beating. The English way to the river. This has been promised to Marie Julie as well. At that time, Joseph. I told myself, this is it. This has got to be the point of reference, quite surely enough, that God uses to add those 80 years. So I know that Marie Jolie mon ami, passed in March of 1941 during the German occupation of France. So I started adding, for my own curiosity, 80 years to 1941, and I arrived to the, to the year 2021. So if my theory, and I could be wrong, I could be completely off, but if this theory, and I wrote it about it as well in the book, no, is correct. This, the beginning of the unraveling of these prophetic events would start as a starting base in 2021, 2022, 2023, 2024, and the year 83 
or 84, which would be 2025, would be devastating, according to the message of our Lord Jesus Christ. What happened in 2021? It was the apotheosis of a pandemia throughout the world, which, which forced the Catholic Church all across the planet to close for the first time in its history the, its doors, even on Sundays and holidays. What happened in 2022? Joseph, the blooming, unthinkable, Russia threw its armored brigades in Ukraine, thus flirting with World War III. What happened in 2023? This war, this special military operation that the Russians called in Ukraine, transformed itself, whether we like it or not, into de facto a proxy world war between the nations of NATO and an alliance de facto that has taken place, that has been created between Russia, Iran, North Korea, and lamentably, China. And this war in 2023 spread throughout the Middle East with Hamas attack on Israel on October of that year. 2024, Russia is winning. They are beating the Ukrainians to a pulp. And not just the Ukrainians, the um, pride of NATO, the Americans, the French, the English, who have put billions and billions of euros and American dollars an armament, an arsenal that is superior to some of the major nations of the world, more times than France and Germany and England together combined have. Now, they've sent Abrams, Challenger, Leopards. We've sent the French army AMX tents, uh, Caesar cannons, long distance, missiles through by the quite, by quantities that no nations today even have. The Americans' reserves are seriously depleted. The yes. French, as I mentioned earlier, have only 11 days of ammunition. If we were involved in a, a conventional fight in Ukraine, the Russians, the Germans, nine days, England, seven. We have never reached a point of such depletement, military speaking, as we are now. And now the Americans are to deal with the, the threat and the pressure in the Pacific with China that is arming itself to the teeth. They are building the equivalent of the Royal Navy and the French military navy every two years. It's, they have already more surface ships than the U.S. Navy. In matters of tonnage, the Americans have a heavier fleet. But in matter of um, numbers, the Chinese have gone over the U.S. Navy. The situation yeah. is great. Yeah. And right now, the Chinese are operating around Taiwan and are threatening the independence of that particular nation. Yeah, I guess our only hope is they have no, they have no real combat experience. They haven't had since the 50s. Not really. So uh, America in its forever wars, you know, we have lots of combat experience. I guess that gives us some sort of an advantage. But three days is all we have in artillery in the, on the border with North Korea right now. Three days. That's it. And they just destroyed their bridges and brought up their artillery pieces a few weeks ago. You know, maybe it was just a show of force, the typical kind of shenanigans of Kim Jong-un and his, and his regime. But either way, they're playing with fire. And here we go. By the way, coffee... Christoph, Christoph Fell, Christoph Fell from Denver. Good morning to you from Denver. Under Stella Mara there. Good morning to you. Uh, thanks for hanging out with us on the X. If you're on X this morning and you're hanging out for the first time, let us know where you're from. We'd love to have you on the team. Praise be to God. Uh, good to see you here. I see Phoebe Diggs. Good morning to you. Christopher, good morning to you. Alberto, our friend from the UK. Catherine Hickey, Jesty Semper Fi. Jay is here. Good morning. Female Casey Royals fan from Nebraska. Good morning to you. One thing I said on Sunday when I put out my video about the uh, the, the writings of St. Irenaeus of Leon back in the second century, and he talks about the Antichrist in his book five of Against Heresies. I says, when you look at the when you look at what St. Irenaeus had to say about the timing of things, it's clear we've got time on the clock. And I think going back to what you said a minute ago, Xavier, so uh, the third temple has not been built. That's going to be the Antichrist temple. That's gonna, he's going to be set up. The great apostasy is in the worshiping of the Antichrist. And there still needs to be a war between the ten kings and the Antichrist, three of which will die, and the other seven will kowtow to the Antichrist, making it possible for him to have that worldwide stage. That yet has not yet quite happened, um, at, least, uh, at least out in the open. You could say cryptically behind the scenes for sure, but it's all related to the fall of the Roman Empire, which St. Irenaeus talks about the Latins or Latinos in his book five. So there's still some things that have not yet happened and not yet taken place would need to take place in order for it to be the true end of time. So to, to tag into what you said a minute ago, Xavier, 
about there's still time on the clock, that there's a new era coming. But with the new era comes the passing of the old, and through the passing of the old comes suffering and, and pain and, and all the rest. And I think that's what a lot of Catholics really aren't prepared for. I can think, I think someone, Mutsan was talking about this earlier when you were reconnecting. Prophecies can scare people and they can create anxiety. Living in a state of grace, pursuing virtue is the bottom line. And you basically said that at the end of the radio program. Go to confession, receive worthily. Live in a state of grace, pursue virtue. If we just do those things, then we will be fine no matter what happens next. But I believe, and I made this point in my video on Sunday, uh, based off of Irenaeus, that most Catholics really are not prepared to die. They're just not. They're not prepared to suffer. They, they really are more worldly than they give themselves credit for. Would you say that's fair? Very much so. Not just the Americans. I think that it's the West altogether. But do remember one thing, and I'm addressing myself to your auditors. No one is uh, immortal. Death will come to us all. Yeah. And what time on earth? The day will come when we will be confronted. We will be in our home bed or in a hospital bed, and we will know that uh, the end is perhaps but hours away. No one can escape it. It's not a question of how we live how we die, but rather how we live, that matters. Now, we know that everyone will have his own apocalypse at the moment of his own death. What we are told right now is a message of hope, because indeed, not only these prophecies are bringing forth what is about to come, what is about to happen, uh, to the point that, according to some prophecies, this world event will no longer be stopped. It can only be um, deterred in matters of intensity. But the great hope in this message is that there will be uh, survivors. There will be the rebirth of a new world. It will be a new renaissance. That's the great hope. And as you said, uh, Joseph, the method to survive what is to come spiritually here, here, and also through our bodies, our person, is exactly to seek refuge by uh, following the precepts of the of dogma of the Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church, going particularly to confession as often as you can, making a life confession. Cleanse yourself from all the wrongdoings you've done in your life. By doing so, you will be as clean as an angel after the priest will give you absolution. Do your penance and go to Mass. If not every day, if you can every day, it would be better. But if you can, because of obligation, constraints of uh, professional obligations, no? Go every Sunday. Do remember as well that according to the Catholic Church, even, yes, this laxist and uh, um, <laughs> very open, uh, and, uh, open one even recognizes that those who do not go, who can go on Sundays to Mass, but refuse to go because it's inconvenient, that is considered a mortal sin, according to the Church today. So it is imperative that if we can, we go to Mass on every Sunday, and that we receive the Holy Eucharist in a state of grace and while being fully aware and lucid that we're not receiving a symbol. No, it is truly the person of Jesus Christ. And if we still have any doubts about this fact, and there was a poll that was made a couple of years ago, I don't know if you ever talked about it on your show, uh, Joseph, but an American poll that showed that only one-third of Catholics, or practicing Catholics, yeah. believe in the true presence of our Lord in the Holy Eucharist. This is the, the the responsibility of this falls upon the clergy. It is up to clergy to clearly teach the faithful that it is not a symbol. We have so many Eucharistic miracles in the world, all of them that show again and again in the Eucharist, in the bleeding host, uh, fibers of a human heart. And always, do you hear me? Always the same type of human blood, AB, which is RH, AB. It's a universal type of, um, of blood. Everyone's, um, whatever your uh, type of blood is, you can receive AB. And it's the same type of AB blood with human fibers of a human heart that has been found in the Shroud of Turin, mm. where our Lord has been wrapped. The message is, is clear. And you have, it appears to me, to be either blind or simply utterly of bad faith, not to understand the message that heaven is trying to send. Find refuge through the holy sacraments of the Catholic Church, confession principally, 
communion, uh, live your lives on the basis of Holy Scriptures, the teachings of our Lord in the Gospels and on the dogma of the faith, which neither angel or man, no bishop, cardinal, or pope can change. Amen. It is well an said. absolute mm -hmm. Well said. Hey, Pac, Johnny, good morning to you. Elizabeth Ramirez, good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Lorenzo, uh, good morning to you. Thanks for being on the team. We have just a couple of minutes left with Xavier. Cap Matt says, I'm from Ireland. Well, good morning from sunny Ireland. Praise be to God. Says, uh, I have a question about exercised holy water and salt to consecrate our homes. Where would we get the exercised exorcism blessing? My local priest wouldn't do this. Well, that's tragic, don't you think, that your local priest wouldn't bless or exercise salt and give you blessed water? Like, that's crazy. I would say go find yourself a priest that will. Uh, call the bishop. Ask the bishop if he's going to do it, if the priests aren't going to do it. And if none of those choices will work, then I would say there's pro you can go visit the SSPX in Ireland. You could visit them, and they'll definitely exercise your salt and your, your holy water and provide that for you as well. So you do have a couple of options. But unfortunately, you're going to have to shop around because if the priests aren't going to step up and do what they're supposed to do, then you just got to vote with your feet and keep moving and find the ones that will. Um, unfortunately, and pray for them because... Woe well, unto those that don't do what the master has asked them to do. I mean, the gospel today, in the, I think, is very apropos for them. They are, they, are, they are the servants of the Lord and the King of Kings, and, the, and uh, if they don't do what they're supposed to, God help them. To those that are given much, much is expected. Hey, um, I missed a comment. Darn it. Jay says, go to the FSSP or traditional blessings. Yay and amen, brother. You and I are on the same team there. Uh, Laura says, I had my house blessed and... With salt, my friend is a priest and did it in Latin. Now, there is, there is a difference between the, um, the, the extraordinary form, the pre-62 blessings and the ex exorcism rites, and the current ones. There's extra prayers and such that go back into tradition that you would receive the benefit from. In fact, Father Gabriel Amorth, God rest his soul, he would often talk about switching between these two in exorcism rites and, you know, when it became appropriate to do so, he would prefer the, the older form because they had, uh, they had additional, uh, additional language, let's just say. So I would look for a traditional priest. Zave, did you want to weigh in on that? You, I, you've said it all. This is exactly correct. Uh, we have uh, Father Michel Rodrigue, who on various occasions, and this has been confirmed to me, by the Diocese of Amos in uh, Quebec, when I called them and I contacted them, uh, Father Michel has been asked on a couple of, quite a few uh, opportunities to exercise uh, homes, even people. Uh, on our show, uh, on our Crook Save Media, uh, Father Michel has exercised live a variety of waters, uh, the viewers' waters and salt and other sacramentals, which only needed at the end the final blessing of a priest face to face. Uh, I spoke with a variety of other exorcists in the United States and in France. They all told me that it was a correct procedure. So we are thinking of doing something that again tonight we will appear at eight o'clock. If you permit me, of course, uh, Joseph, yeah, to mention this. Uh, but at eight o'clock uh, we'll have a live show and we'll talk about it on uh, Okrux Ave Media on the next session where Father Michel. Uh, we'll appear and we'll exercise live all the sacramentals that everyone wants to present forth. So uh, keep a head cold. Uh, there is one thing that Father Michel uh, brings as a message from heaven, which also is a cornerstone in the messages of from heaven in these days. In the events now that once the faithful are made aware of what is coming and what the situation we are living in, and the, in its importance and gravity is, uh, heaven is asking the uh, faithful to remain mm -hmm. calm, to keep a cold head, and not to fall under Satan's trap of anguish or fear. Um, uh, our Lord says through Father Michel that those are feelings that are inspiration from the devil and usually high ways to lose one's faith. Maintain your faith calm, abandon yourself unconditionally at the feet of the cross, follow and obey the Catholic Church, the dogma, the sacramentals, which cannot be changed by any authority of the church, and remain faithful, abandon yourself, and trusting into our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord told Father Michel, if you do this, that is the secret for the salvation and protection of for in the times to come. Amen. Well said. I think we're out of time. Xavier, always a pleasure to have you on. Thanks for coming back. 
Make sure to check out his book, Revelations. We're going to link to it in the show notes, The Hidden Secret Messages and Prophecies of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And like he said, tonight there's going to be a special broadcast. I guess you said 8. Did you mean Eastern? Yes, 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Eastern Standard Time. So 8 Eastern on O Crux Ave Media. We'll link to that as well in the show notes. But you can find us. Google it. Google his name on YouTube. You'll find it there as well. So lots of opportunity. Xavier, God bless you and God love you, my friend. Always a pleasure to have you on the team. Tomorrow on the show, Eric Sammons is going to be here. And Edward Clancy from Aid to the Church in Need is going to be here. We're going to be talking about their annual Christian persecution report. Not looking good. Another sign of our times, I would argue. So a lot more ACTs headed your way. Share us with a friend.